Hello, and welcome to episode 100 of the Breachside Broadcast. On tonight's episode, we have the conclusion of Led Zeppelin, followed by a set of Gremlin vignettes. But first, a very special message from our sponsor. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy 100 episodes to the British Art Broadcast. Happy birthday to you. Earl wasn't sure of the hour, but judging by the ache in his back and the way his eyes were stinging with fatigue, it was likely after midnight. He stood for a moment and stretched, grimacing as his back cracked. At his feet lay a series of oily washers and copper piping and a partly disassembled gas valve. He finished refilling the hydraulic fluid reservoirs and testing the controls and was now checking the gas valves for fatigue and cracking. Exposure to hydrogen gas made the metal brittle over time, and he wanted to replace any suspect joints before they were subjected to high pressure. In truth, any one of his engineers could have done these basic maintenance tasks, but the entire crew had pulled a double shift to get the ship ready for yesterday evening's test flight, and he didn't have it in him to make them stay late again to finish these few paltry tasks before the professor's inspection in the morning. Better he gets them done himself and let the crew rest. They had the first field test of the mechanism coming up in four days, and he'd need his entire staff to be sharp as tacks for that. A single miscalculation, and best not dwell on it. Earl crouched over the gas valve and began to piece it back together, cleaning off the excess grease with a rag before screwing each section back into place. Valves and washers and hydraulics were all plain enough fare for an engineer, but the thing that waited in the airship's nose was several orders of magnitude more complex. Its construction had been so secret that only Earl and the Professor had been present for the final assembly. As for its purpose, well, Earl understood the premise, but the actual physics behind its function was something that only the Professor could truly comprehend. As Earl would be on board when they tested it, he hoped that his faith in the man was well placed. With the valve back in place, Earl checked the nuts one last time to make sure they were tight and shuffled on to the next. Only four more valves, then back to his bunk for a cold meal of beans and sliced bologna, and a few hours of blissful sleep before the morning inspections. The last valve was in place, and Earl had just begun to push his tools back into his belt when his nose twitched. He'd had a number of heated discussions before with the guard commander about the dangers of his guardsmen having a crafty smoke in the immediate vicinity of 125,000 cubic feet of hydrogen gas, but they never quite seemed to get the message and sooner or later, one of them always sparked up again. Muttering under his breath, Earl stepped out onto the gangplank to find the culprit. He had a suspicion it would be Stuart again. No matter how many times he educated about flammable products in the hangar, he always seemed eager for his cigarette breaks. Earl would just have to ask for him to be transferred this time, as much as he liked Stuart on a personal level. When he got to the side of the ship, Earl paused. The hangar was on fire. Oh, he said. About a dozen crates and their straw packing had gone up in a savage conflagration that was already licking hungrily at the northern wall. The flames were also starting to reach up for the airship's hindquarters, only twenty feet or so overhead. That was bad. Fire! Earl screamed, hopping up and down on the gantry, mostly because the panic of his discovery had momentarily robbed him of the ability to do anything else. Fire! Nothing really happened for a second or two. Stuart's head appeared from behind a brick partition at the far end of the hangar, 
a self-rolled cigarette hanging out of his mouth. Huh? Fire! Earl screamed again, pointing frantically down at the spreading disaster. Stuart's eyes widened, and a cigarette dropped from his mouth. The hefty guardsman snatched up a steel bucket filled with sand and began to lumber across the hangar. Never mind the bucket, you damned fool! Earl clapped his hands to the sides of his head with exasperation. We have to get the airship out! The mooring ropes, man! The mooring ropes! Stuart skidded to a halt, dropped the bucket and began to run back the way he'd come, fumbling for his bayonet. By now the alarm was starting to spread, and faces were appearing from doors all around the hangar. Smoke was pooling against the underside of the roof, and the dorsal half of the airship's superstructure was softening through the haze. In less than a minute, it would be obscured completely. Professor Tewalder came hurtling out of the dormitory, his long legs flying under his nightshirt. Open the hangar door, he howled, arms overhead as he ran for the huge roller door at the west end. Open it, I say! Guardsmen were streaming in now. A few of them were pitching buckets of sand over the fire, but it had already spread to the huge coils of hemp and rope at the rear of the hangar, switching the smoke from grey to a thick, noxious black. Others were sawing at the mooring ropes with knives, but the bulk of them had congregated at the roller door and were struggling to disengage the lock from the inside. Earl! Hakim shouted as he joined the struggle at the door. Start the engines! We'll ram the door if we have to! The engineer ducked back inside, tripped over his toolbox and stumbled to the engine console. The electric start buttons had been considered a risk during the design phase, and so each engine gondola had its own manual starter handle. Earl began to frantically pump the first handle, and was rewarded seconds later by a throaty roar as engine number one burst into life. The bloody sky began to push forward and to the right. The mooring ropes creaked in response, and a few that were mostly sawn through snapped under the increasing tension. The roller door began to screech open under the combined efforts of about twenty frantic guardsmen and one very irate chief scientist. Smoke immediately lunged through the opening gap, swirling up into the night sky. Engine number two sputtered, coughed, and then revved into life, pushing the airship forward again, the direction of thrust evening out as both propellers got up to speed, agitating the growing smoke cloud overhead. The last mooring rope came away with a loud twang, and the airship started to pick up momentum. The gangway scraped and sparked its way across the hangar floor. Earl gripped the pilot yoke, trying to keep the airship level as it moved with increasing speed towards the still-widening gap of the roller door. Quite apart from whether the door could be opened in time, there were only fifteen feet of clearance between the airship and the top of the doorframe, and if he misjudged it, he'd at best rip off the dorsal airfoil, and at worst, rupture the entire upper superstructure. Extraction was normally done by hand at a walking pace, but there was just no time for that now. Push men! Professor Tewalder cried, his attention batting between the slowly widening door and the rapidly approaching airship, which was now a black silhouette against a rising wall of orange flame. The whole back of the hangar was now on fire. Other scientists were stumbling out of the dormitory, coughing and looking around with consternation. My magnetopropulsive velocipede, Dr. Forbes shouted, looking forlornly up at the airship as it continued on. There's no time, Hakim replied testily. We must save the airship. But our work was on board too. If we save the airship, we save it all. Earl wiped sweat from his brow, peering through the forward window and trying to ignore the screeching sounds of the trailing gangplank. As much as he wanted to pull up and give it clearance, he knew he just didn't have room. Something exploded behind the airship, and it shuddered. Black smoke had almost completely filled the hangar now, and even the scientists were running for their lives. The hangar door was only about three quarters open, but they were out of time. It was now or never. Earl rammed the throttle to maximum as flames licked against the airship's rear. The bloody sky roared forward into the gap, barely squeaking through like a cork from a bottle. It scraped the paint from the top of the airfoil and knocked wood chips and plaster out of the doorframe, but the ship was free. Soot stained and half clothed, the scientists whooped and applauded as Earl steered the airship further out and away from the burning hangar. He knew that the gas tanks that held spare hydrogen in the manufacturing plant in the adjoining building wouldn't take long to overheat and explode, and he was determined to be as far away as possible when that happened. 
He was just beginning to think that the science division's prize asset might have been saved after all, when big black birds began to thud against the sides of the gondola. Zip had watched for the perfect moment, which he knew wouldn't be long in coming. It had been child's play to start the fire. Most of the guardsmen on shift were either asleep or smoking down at the western end of the hangar, and Zip had been able to sneak over to the pile of empty packing crates and straw left in a corner to set it to light. It went up easily, and he made a sharp exit along with his gang down the corridor, up the ladder, and onto the roof. There they just crouched and waited, listening to the cries of alarm from within. Pretty soon, smoke was sifting through the rusty holes in the corrugated iron roof, and a glowing orange light lit their grinning faces. When the nose of the huge airship began to push through the hangar door, Zip knew they had it in the bag. The fools had been so desperate to get the airship out that they hadn't given a thought to security. The craft was completely undefended and probably had nothing more than a skeleton crew aboard. Ready, boys, he said as the bulk of the huge craft pushed through the door and out into the night. Teach them to fear the Iron Skeeters. The Iron Skeeters vaulted over the side of the hangar roof, spreading their wings and swerving down onto the flanks of the airship. They bounced against the superstructure and scrabbled against the trailing mooring ropes, but by and large they managed to catch hold of the underslung gondola and flapping gangway. It was a touch undignified, but effective. While his crew did the grunt work, Zip set himself to more important matters. He adjusted his harness and leapt off of the hangar roof, swooping down, rather majestically, he thought, over the heads of the frantic scientists. You have had the great honor of being the first... His sentence was cut off as he rose too high to be heard. He adjusted for another dive. To be robbed by the true sky pirates. This was the work of the Iron Skeeters. A bystander might have said that the scientists and guards were too busy dealing with the fire or watching the assault on the actual ship to even notice the shouting gremlin. But Zip knew they were too terrified to acknowledge him. He turned on the wind and made for his new airship. Professor Tewalder's expression did a complicated jig from frantic worry to ecstatic relief, to confusion, to recognition, to dawning horror. He watched his airship escape the flames, only to come under attack by an unexpected flock of large black and green birds. Thieves! the professor suddenly exclaimed. You're trying to steal my airship! The night-shirted scientists began to race in a bandy-legged manner after the craft waving in the air and shouting with indignation. The guardsmen were still busy fighting the fire. A burly shape ploughed through the scientists, knocking them to the ground and leaving them choking on smoke and brushing themselves off. Was that... was that a silurid? Professor Forbes stuttered. Have you ever seen a silurid wearing a hat? Hakim shot back. The silurid built up speed and made a magnificent leap at the airship which was still relatively low. It grabbed the side with a clawed hand and pulled itself up. The hat stayed proudly atop its head the entire way. Quick as a snake, the marauder was on his feet, brandishing a pistol. Earl surreptitiously slid the back wrench into his tool belt. He wouldn't get two steps before being gunned down. All right, nobody move, the gremlin cried waving the weapon around in a manner that made the engineer cringe. After a minute, the new arrival seemed to realize that Earl was the only one there. Just you? That's right. The gremlin grinned. He had a fly stuck between his teeth. Earl tried not to stare. My crew and I are commandeering this vessel. I am Captain Zip. Sky Pirate. He put a lot of emphasis on the Sky Pirate part and Earl cottoned on that he was meant to be impressed. He nodded dutifully. Right. Goodness me. Well, how can I help you, Captain? You are now our prisoner, as this is our ship. You will be treated fairly. You will be fed, clothed, and cared for, as we are honorable buccaneers, though the terror of the skies we may be, Zip said, as more gremlins started to file in through the open gondola door. They looked around with interest, jostling and shoving each other. 
We are the Iron Skeeters. Heard of us? O glanced again at the pistol. Oh, yes, absolutely. The famous Sky Pirates. Yes. This seemed to take the gremlin by surprise, but he quickly hid it. Of course you have. And soon the entire world will know the name of Captain Zip and his Iron Skeeters. He paused. Where did you hear of us? Earl swallowed hard. Um, heard it on the Ethervox? Zip beamed. Right, yes, the Ethervox. Of course they tell our tales there, spreading the word across all of Malifaux that we, the... An older gremlin cut Zip off. Um, Captain, do you know how to fly this thing? Zip paused for a second. Confusion and then horror crossed his face before he straightened himself and adjusted his coat. He turned to Earl, eyeing his tool belt. Are you this vessel's mechanic? Engineer, Earl corrected. You know how to fly it? Yes, sir, I do. Zip turned to the older gremlin. As I planned, we have captured the ship's engineer, an expert in flight. As our prisoner, he is bound to do as we say. He will fly the ship until I have sufficiently learned the controls. Engineer, he turned to Earl, take us up. Earl complied by throttling up the engines and angling the airfoils while chewing his lip. It made no sense to defy them, at least not until he'd formulated a plan of escape. Even without the weapons, there were too many of them for him to handle alone. He'd have to think of something else. He noticed that Zip was watching his actions carefully. What's that you're doing there? Zip asked, waving at the pilot yoke with the pistol muzzle. That's the yoke, Earl explained. It controls yaw and roll. And that? Throttle control for engines number one and number two, and this lever controls the pitch airfoils. The gremlin had him go through each lever and panel methodically, his quick eyes running over the dials and gauges, soaking it all up with an obvious hunger. And this? The pirate captain pointed at the control panel for the mechanism. Earl's mouth dried up. He'd forgotten about that. Heaven help them all if the gremlins realized just exactly what they'd stolen. If they figured out how to switch it on. Gas valves, he stammered. A uh, gas valve controller. Just then a huge shape in the still open gondola doorway blocked the firelight from outside. Earl watched in astonishment as the Silurid loped into the cockpit. It was wearing a sailor's hat. It noticed Earl standing alone at the front of the cockpit and stared at him. Stared at him like a starving man stares at a roast chicken dinner. Earl swallowed nervously. This here is the first mate, the captain was saying. After me, he's next in line of command. If I am incapacitated, you are to follow his orders to the letter. Yes, sir, Earl nodded. The first mate hadn't blinked. It licked its lips. Oh, boy, Earl whispered. Very well, Zip said. I will leave the first mate to watch you as I inspect my new ship. Earl began to sweat. The first mate showed its teeth. This place is a treasure trove, Zip whispered hoarsely. They had crept through the ship, checking room to room. It was fully stocked with food and supplies, and it seemed like it had been preparing to transport some unusual items. There were windows along the wall out of which Zip could see the open night sky and Malifaux's twin moons peering back at him. There were some rooms more like cells. These doorless chambers were festooned with files and clipboards stuffed with papers and countless rolls of drawings and schematics, none of which made any sense to the gremlins. What did catch their immediate attention, however, with the objects in each room. Many were only partly constructed, or an unrecognizable scattering of components without purpose. But there were a number of other devices on tables and stands whose properties were immediately recognizable. The first thing Zip had found was some kind of pistol. It was heavier and bulkier than a conventional revolver, but an experimental pull of the trigger had lit the room up with a blue-white flash and sent an arc of jagged electricity ripping across the far wall. It's a lightning gun, the older gremlin breathed, his eyes wide. No, it's my lightning gun, Zip corrected, thrusting the weapon into his belt. 
Hey, cried one of the others, staggering out of an adjoining room with his arms wrapped around a weighty metal object. It looked rather like an oversized bucket with a water tank on top and copper piping threaded around its circumference. What do you reckon this is? Zip cast his eye over it. While devoid of any engineering qualifications, and blissfully ignorant of everything that could conceivably be bracketed under the heading of science, Zip enjoyed fireworks as much as the next gremlin, and this thing looked kind of like a big metal firework. His pulse quickened when the object was turned around to reveal a heavy leather shoulder harness and belt affixed to the underside. Do you know what this is? he breathed, stroking the cool steel with reverent fingers. A steel? said one hopeful voice piping up. I think, Zip said, his voice quavering with excitement. I think this might be a rocket pack. Say what now, said the other voice, mildly disappointed that the sloshing tank didn't contain alcohol. A rocket pack for flying. I have heard tales of those on the Ethervox. They say... Zip was interrupted by a collective ooh as the gremlins gathered round to touch its magnificence. Get back there, Zip snapped, protectively hunkering over the device. This is a precision instrument. Hey, boss called the older gremlin from a doorway near the end of the corridor. If you like that, you're gonna love this. They stampeded over to the doorway and stared in. The machine was obviously meant to be ridden. There was a padded leather saddle and foot stirrups on either side. A curious metal bar projecting from the front held a series of dials, switches, and levers, and looked like it could be moved through several axes, judging by the joint at the base. Metal pipes projected from the sides and back, marked with the rainbow discoloration of extreme heat, and four large paddle-shaped appendages protruded from the machine's midsection, made of wire and steel rods with some kind of thin silvery fabric stretched over them. It looks kind of like, started the old gremlin. A big skeeter, finished Zip. The sense of building excitement was irresistible. All the gremlins could taste something special in the air. Zip had been ranting for weeks about how this was all meant to happen, and now that they were here, they'd found a lightning gun, rocket pack, and a giant flying mosquito thing, and they hadn't even gotten round to really using the airship yet. It had to be destiny. This is it, boys, Zip said. This is our destiny, to take to the skies, to claim what is ours by force and by cunning. This was not mere chance. We are the Iron Skeeters, and we are Sky Pirates. A cheer ripped through the crew. The gremlins made their way back to the cockpit, just as the first mate had edged a bit too close to Earl. They carried with them an array of gadgets, one of which he recognized as Dr. Forbes' velocipede. Captain Zip glanced out of the side porthole, and seemingly satisfied with the altitude they'd gained, turned his attention to the velocipede. Do you know how to work this? he asked nudging it with his foot. I've seen the schematics, Earl said. I understand the physical principles, so I... Sure, I could. I mean, yes. Yes, I know how it works. Zip was grinning. So can you build more of them? If I get you the parts? Uh, sure, okay, Earl nodded, feeding the Silurid's hungry eyes crawling all over him. Its long claws were moving indecisively, as though it was unable to decide which juicy morsel it wanted to eat first. Hear that, boys? Zip said. A fleet of flying machines! The gremlin crew cheered. Of course, there is no sense in simply having a flying machine, Zip continued. It must be done with style, flair. People need to know the name of the terror that is swooping down from the skies. Could these be formed to look more like Skeeter's? Magnificent iron noses which plummet from the air, thirsting for the blood of those. I want mine to look like a pig, one gremlin shouted. And a pig for Roscoe, Zip rolled his eyes. Earl couldn't take any more. Yes, I can make them look however you like. He took a nervous step away from the first mate, still gripping the controls at a now awkward angle. Excellent, Zip said, noting the human's discomfort at the first mate's presence. What is your name? Earl. All right, Earl. You make me copies of this here flying machine with style and keep us in the air and I'll keep the first mate away from you. Deal? The engineer nodded. What other choice did he have? 
All right, Earl, set the infamy on course for the bayou. Infamy? Earl asked. Indeed, Zip said, tossing some smoked pork to the first mate, who caught it in his jaws. The ship needs a fitting name. Infamy. Gremlin Vignettes Other than the brief loss of control caused by the etheric shockwaves of the Governor General's death, the passing of one of Malifaux's most powerful individuals went relatively unnoticed in the bayou. Of all the gremlins, Summerteeth Jones cared the least and was, in fact, surprised to learn that there had been a Governor General in charge of the city in the first place. Far more important, at least in his estimation, was the nearby LeBlanc family. They had been sneaking into his lands and poaching wild pigs for months. But when Dempsey and LeBlanc, one of the bosses of the LeBlanc family, bumped into summer at a bayou bash and spilled the bigger gremlin's drink, that was the final straw. Summer got his family all riled up on fiery speeches and moonshine, marched them south to the border they shared with the smaller LeBlanc family, and made his intentions known by ordering his minions to shoot the LeBlanc lands to death a truly withering amount of gunfire was pumped into the surrounding land. And when Summer finally trudged off atop his riding pig, the trees, mud, and underbrush of the LeBlanc family had been taught a dire lesson. Dempsey and LeBlanc responded to this insult by showing up at the next bayou bash with two tall hats that had been sewn together, making a single, double-tall hat. There was a great deal of debate as to whether or not this counted as a single hat, but regardless of the legitimacy of the double hat, it was clear to everyone that Dempsey had offered a serious insult to Summer. The insult sparked off a bitter feud between the Joneses and the LeBlancs, and while the smart money was on the Joneses, nobody could deny that Dempsey and LeBlanc had a mighty fine head. As the Joneses to her south became embroiled in a feud, Ma Tuckett turned her family's attention westward, across the Frostron and towards the Hollow Point pumping station. The humans had hollowed out a mountain, and filled it with all manner of complicated and noisy machines, all of which had piqued her interest. Her bushwhackers crept into the pumping station in the middle of the night, and set up a camp in the bowels of the humid and often insect-infested machinery. The humans rarely spent much time in the half-flooded tunnels, as the humidity and nesting insects bothered them, but to the bushwhackers, it wasn't much different than the bayou, save that the insects all tended to be smaller than their thumbs. Bit by bit, the bushwhackers began to steal from the humans at the pumping station. At first, it was just clothing and tools. A set of overalls would go missing, or a mechanical wrench would disappear from someone's workbench when they weren't looking. There were reports of things glimpsed or overheard in the tunnels and access vents, but these were dismissed by the union leadership as the result of hungover workers trying to blame their forgetfulness on an outside source. It was only when a crate of Abyssinian lightning rifles that had been earmarked for reverse engineering disappeared from the research labs that the leadership realized that their workers had been telling the truth. They sent constructs into the tunnels to run the gremlins out, but their advance was stalled by crude traps and a cackling gremlin with a large spoon. Despite numerous meetings, the Union has been unable to come up with a good way to drive the gremlins out of their tunnels, which amuses Martucket no end. The Lacroix family, meanwhile, were locked in a battle with a much more dangerous enemy. Four years prior, the Red Cage had fallen from the sky and landed in the northern portions of their land. The initial impact took the lives of countless gremlins. But more worrying were the twisted creatures of desiccated flesh that crawled up from the resulting crater. Since that day, Ophelia has been forced to defend her lands against a never-ending tide of twisted abominations. The number of abominations crawling from the crater has ebbed and flowed over the years. 
Some months, the abominations pour forth from the crater in waves as thick as skeeters over standing water. And other months, the Lacroix family can count the number of abominations they were forced to put down on both hands. The governor's death triggered another surge of abominations, putting Ophelia and her family on the defensive once again. Hiding behind their barricades, they pumped countless bullets, shells, musket balls, and catapulted pigs into the encroaching tide. But no matter how many of the things they destroyed, more clambered their way up out of the red cage. Realizing that her family would eventually run out of ammunition and be overrun, she hatched a clever plan to get the humans to fight the undead in her stead. All it took was a few dozen Lacroix, spanking their bare bottoms with an eye shot of Latigo, to draw the Ortega family into the bayou, at which point the Lacroix family scattered, leaving the humans to face the abominations. The Lacroix lingered at the edges of the conflict, picking off stragglers where they could, but for the most part, they were content to let the Ortega family do the brunt of the fighting. Halfway across the bayou, Wong tinkered with dangerous forces that should probably have just been left alone. Most gremlins considered the sunken ruins of Kythera to be cursed, and avoided them as best they were able. But Wong didn't believe in all that superstitious nonsense. Or rather, he did, but the voices in his three-demon bag had been nagging him for so long that he'd simply ceased to care whether or not the spirits at Kythera turned him into a frog. Once he had stolen a boat and pulled it out to the center of the ruins, Wong opened his three-demon bag as the voices within had instructed. The only trap within the bag immediately began to wail and shriek in unholy glee, their spectral forms rising upwards and swirling overhead in a storm of flashing lights and sinister laughter. Wong waited patiently on the boat until the Oni had finished being sinister and returned to their bag, at which point they instructed him in how to perform a ritual to contact their long-lost master, Ling Zuzi. By that time, however, Wong was getting a bit bored of being at Kythera, so he just sat down in the boat, chewed his toenails down to a respectable length, and lied to the voices, claiming that the ritual hadn't worked. After some initial confusion, they decided that Wong would need to consult with a more powerful summoner in order to complete the ritual. Thinking the voices had said, Summoner, Wong happily agreed to seek out the Bayou boss to see what he knew about dark rituals and powerful owning. He didn't think Summoner would be much help, but if the voices thought differently, who was Wong to argue? Besides, Summoner usually had some pretty good hooch, and it had been a while since Wong had sampled some of his moonshine. In the weeks after the governor's death, the Turner family began to have issues with the steadily increasing numbers of bunyip along their southern borders. The seal-like creatures had occasionally come upriver to prey upon the pigs that were plentiful in Turner's lands, but never in any significant numbers. Now, however, they were starting to carve out a niche for themselves in the bayou's ecosystem, and that niche seemed to be preying upon the corralled pigs of the Turner family, as well as the Turners themselves. And willing to watch as their lives and livelihood were eaten out from under them, they turned to wise old Ulix to help them devise a way to keep the bunyips away from the family's corrals. With especially designed fences and clever pig sheets, which were just large camouflage sheets that the gremlins would throw over their pigs at night to hide them from the bunyips, Ulix managed to significantly reduce the number of pigs the turners were losing to the ravenous predators. Despite the relief of his kin, however, Ulix realized that this was a temporary solution at best. Their pigs were dying less often, but the bunya population continued to increase with each passing day. Ulix proposed that he and his fellow ranchers start breeding the smallest and meanest pigs they could find to fight the bunyips. It would take time, he reasoned, but with selective breeding and a steady diet of bunyip meat, they could soon have a sizable number of surly pigs with an innate dislike for their one-time predators. It would take some effort to convince his fellow turners that breeding small and meaner pigs was a good idea, but he was confident that once the first generation of anti-bunyip pigs had been born, the others would see the wisdom of his plan and follow his lead. The brewmaster disappeared from the bayou for a time, ostensibly to return over the mountains to secure more of the secret ingredients used to make his most intoxicating and coveted concoctions. Taking his tri chi with him, he travelled north toward the Ten Peaks, and then took a familiar detour toward the mountain town of Promise. 
There he met with his contacts in the Ten Thunders, who were pleased to learn that he had ingratiated himself so thoroughly with the various gremlins of the bayou. His next assignment, they said, was to start agitating the families along the northern borders of the bayou. The Ten Thunders wanted the gremlins to launch larger attacks against the Guild and Union on the other bank of the Frostron, and to help with that, they had crates of guns and ammunition for the brewmaster to take back to the bayou and distribute to the most aggressive of the gremlin families. The brewmaster bowed and accepted the offered weapons without complaint, but he was silent on his journey back to the swamp. He was beginning to have doubts about his partnership with the Ten Thunders. They had given him what he wanted, that was true, but now they were turning his entire race into a weapon against their enemies. Gremlins did not care overly much for the survival of their kin, but the brewmaster had a larger perspective than most gremlins, and now that same perspective was bothering him. As he passed through Tong lands, he accidentally left the weapon crates behind in one of their villages. The Tongs had always been antagonistic toward Promise and the Ten Thunders, and the brewmaster needed to buy some time to consider the repercussions of his actions and the ultimate fate of his people. That's it for another episode of the Breachside Broadcast. Here's to a hundred more. Join us next time for more Tales of Malathon.